Welcome, and thank you for joining us for Human Kinetics webinar, Understanding and Using Velocity-Based Training to Maximize Sports Performance. My name is Alexis Kuntz, and I'm the Associate Director of Social Media Marketing at Human Kinetics, and I will be the facilitator for today's presentation. The webinar is scheduled for one hour. The session is being recorded and will be available for playback. By the end of the day tomorrow, you can expect an email containing the link to the recording. A certificate of participation for today's webinar will also be attached to that email. Due to the large number of participants today, you'll be able to hear me and our presenter, but you'll not be able to speak to us directly. If you have any problems with the audio, you may call in by clicking the, quote, use telephone option in the audio tab and dialing in with the number and the audio pin provided. You may also send questions anytime throughout the questions tab or the chat box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. We'll allow time at the end of the presentation for a question and answer session. To submit questions during the webinar, use the question function located above the chat function. Just type your questions in the box and click send. I'll collect the questions and provide them to the present presenter during the Q&A. So we're looking forward to a great presentation today, but first I'd like to give you a little more information about our presenter. Nuncio Signore is a certified strength and conditioning coach and the owner and operator of Rockland Peak Performance. He's also a member of the American Baseball Biomechanics Society and director of the Pitching Lab in New Jersey. For the past 10 years, he has been one of the most in-demand strength and conditioning coaches in the New York and New Jersey areas, working with players from the Minnesota Twins, Anaheim Angels, New York Yankees, New York Mets, Arizona Diamondbacks, and Seattle Mariners, to name a few. He's written articles for publications such as Inside Pitch Magazine and speaks annually at baseball clinics such as Pitch of Palooza, Bridge the Gap, New York Coaches Convention, Be the Best, and Inside Baseball Coaches Conventions. So without further ado, I will hand the presentation over. Welcome, Nunzio. Thanks, Alexis. Um, <clears throat> thanks, all of you, for tuning in. And um, this is going to be a very uh, interesting 50 minutes. Uh, it's a very, uh, it's a very intense topic to speak about all in 50 minutes. Um, so bear with me. I'm going to try to make this um, as thorough as possible that I can in 50 minutes, but it's really great um, that you're going to be able to watch this later um, because this is the type of presentation that you're going to want to really sink into and be able to pause and look at some slides. So if there's something that you don't quite we're going a little too quick for you. I apologize, but trying to get a lot of information in here uh, in a short amount of time. Um, and also, you can uh, grab the book if you like. I'd like to thank uh, Human Kinetics, first of all, um, Laura Pulliam and Alexis Kuntz and Mike Mejitas for, for um, really making me sound a lot smarter than I really am. Uh, uh, <clears throat> publishing, just going through my, uh, my, my, my book and uh, helping me out with putting my thoughts on paper. Um, of course, Dr. Brian Mann, who is a big influence on me, as, a, as Yuri Verkashansky. These are two guys that I really, really have learned a lot about velocity-based training from. Um, and if you don't know who they are, I really suggest you dive deep uh, into it to further educate yourself on velocity-based training. And Carl Val is another strength and sport coach that um, I have much respect for, who also um, is a big proponent of velocity-based training. Uh, this is my book that is now out and available on Human Kinetics. There'll be, um, <clears throat> there'll be a coupon code at the end that will help you uh, get this book for 20% off. And uh, without further ado, let's talk about it. In the next 60 minutes, we're gonna talk about what is VBT, some of the tools of the trade, why we use it, why it's effective, the special strength zones, understanding some of the metrics, the prerequisites of do you qualify to even use VBT, and we're gonna look at some periodization and implementing VBT into the yearly plan of an athlete's program. So how I got started. Uh, my aha moment was 2010 to 2015, um, four to five year lifespan with my athletes. If I get a kid in high school, I've got them through college. If I get a kid in college, I've got them through college. I generally get four to five years uh, with my athletes. Um, as a strength and conditioning coach, uh, you know, I was under the impression that let's just keep getting stronger, we will get more powerful. Let's get more stronger, we will get more powerful. Um, I noticed that 
strength increased in power and vertical jump. And with my baseball players, their throwing velocity uh, began to plateau after year two. They were getting stronger, but what we were actually trying to achieve as far as power and speed go, that was getting diminishing returns. Um, I started reading uh, Verkashansky's special strength training, and I picked up a copy of Dr. Brian Mann's Developing Explosive Athletes because um, I had heard along the grapevine that these were great texts to um, help develop power and speed in your athletes with the help of some devices. So I got myself a Tendo unit, I rolled up my sleeves, and I got into the trenches. Um, so what is velocity-based training? Um, it's a method for evaluating the intensity of a given moment, and it calculates displacement and time through the monitoring of bar or body speeds. Um, by doing this, it allows an athlete to train in a spe specified zone, helping to create a specific training adaptation, as well as measuring displacement and time. Um, we can calculate how fast they're moving the bar, and we're able to, with the load and the velocity, calculate, better calculate uh, peak power. So for me personally, um, I have a lot of athletes and teams in my facility, and I know that me and my coaches, um, I feel comfortable training two to three athletes at a time and really being able to focus on if the load is right um, and form. But um, after that, as you can see in this picture, when you're dealing with six, seven, eight, nine guys um, at a time in a weight room, it, uh, I dare anybody to tell me that they can monitor the load of every guy. And, you know, it be, it, there's a bit of autonomy that comes into play. It allows these athletes by strapping on a VVT unit to get external feedback and um, it creates a competitive environment and it makes them responsible for their own training, which is huge in high school athletes when they get into college uh, because they become role models in the weight room um, because of their education on how they train themselves. So um, I apologize for this slide. It's a, uh, there's a couple slides in here that had came up sideways, but what you're basically seeing is we, uh, it, it takes external feedback on the speed of the lift. Athletes can get immediate feedback on power and intent, which helps translate to great performance in sport. So this athlete is picking up the bar, and as you can see, every time he comes up, right above him, there's a 0.68, a 0.71. That's giving us the speed he is lifting that. Okay, um, on the right hand side, it will give us an average velocity um, that he's moving that set. And as we'll learn a little bit later, that correlates to a percentage of his one rep max and a special adaptation that we're looking for, whether it be max strength, strength speed, speed strength, uh, or what have you. Tools of the trade <clears throat> linear position transducers are the first type of Tendo unit, the most common and the original. Uh, types of VBT units. It consists of a hardwired cable measuring sensor, such as a potentiometer or rotary encoder. Basically, these things are like tape measures and stopwatches, as Brian, Brian Mann would say. Um, they're the gold standard and slightly more reliable than accelerometers, which are strapped on your body. Um, the sensor converts the change in distance of the cable to voltage and ultimately velocity and acceleration. And this is the key thing. It also calculates average force as well as power. Um, accelerometers do not calculate force. So uh, they are very expensive and they occupy a rack. They have to be dedicated. They're not easily, they're not easy to move around, but they are the gold standard um, as far as if you're training one athlete at a time, uh, you can't go wrong. This is the way to go. An accelerometer such as a push band. Um, more recently, uh, they use algorithms to detect start, stop, and bar path. Uh, do not have a hardwired cable to calculate angles, so readings can be slightly more skewed than those of a linear position transducer. But they're very affordable, they're great in team settings, and when ranges are being used, um, but they currently lack the capability to measure force in real time. So what I will tell you is I have 14 of these units in my facility. Um, athletes will sign them out and they'll, it takes about a, it's about a week learning curve for them to learn how to use it. My coaches help them with that. But I can tell you as soon as they start to use it, I watch results go up 
The competition factor by getting that external queuing is huge. Um, I'm a big believer in it. And the, the guys come in now and, you know, to the point where if they're all, if they're all signed out, they will actually wait to actually, till, till they can sign one in. So why do we use it? Research in Spain revealed a few key findings about some of the benefits. Uh, Gonzalez Badillo, Sanchez Medina, very popular BBT study. People who train with maximal velocity during the concentric phase, and we'll talk about what that is, of a lift or movement, attain better strength and power results than those who do not train with maximal intended velocity. This is creating intent and competition in the athlete when they can see that they're making or not making their velocity. Velocity decreases fairly linearly across a set of traditional strength training exercises, such as bench presses and squats, and velocity is closely related to the percentage of the one rep max. Um, we're going to talk about that. It is, it is very closely related. I think it was 0.989 or 0.998 or something like that. I can't remember what the study said, but it's, it's in the book. It's very closely related to a one rep max. And why is it effective? Um, for all you coaches out there, um, you're very aware of the said principle, but if you are not, this states that training should create the adaptation or trait that is needed to excel in our desired sport. Basically, you wanna train fast you to be fast. You wanna train heavy to get strong. So one key advantage of VBT is the ability for athletes or coaches to ensure that the desired trait they're trying to achieve is being developed. Every type of strength or trait has a speed. So if we're not training in the required zone, um, in other words, that desired speed, then we're not really developing the strength or traits we're, we're chasing. And I have, a little, uh, I have a little chart down here. It's a modified chart that I made um, for my own purposes that Jim Aware had recently released. Um, and it shows absolute strength accelerative strength, strength force, strength speed, speed strength, and starting strength. And underneath, it correlates to a one rep max. So if we're looking to train absolute max strength, and we know we need to be between 80 and 100% of our one rep max, those lower body speed ranges and upper body speed ranges, that's what we're looking for, under 0.50 meters per second. When we get, as we get later in the off season, we'll, and closer to the uh, competitive season, those speeds will go up because we're starting to get fast. And as we work to the right of that continuum, you will see that the percentage of a one rep max as well as the speeds go up. And we're going to, that's basically a gist of what we're going to talk about today. Um, there's about three, about three or four geeky slides in this presentation. There was no way for me to avoid them. I think they're important. Um, and this is one of them, so bear with me. Um, there's four ways a cell produces force and produces a stimulus. Myofibro hypertrophy, this is the actin and myosin contractile proteins. Um, this is our uh, accelerative strength, submax strength, or what we call sport-specific hypertrophy, okay? It's 60 to 80% of a one rep max, um, or I like to go 75 to 85, as you can see on the left side. Um, this is what we use to train the type two fiber, uh, and it's not quite max strength. Um, the, next, the next type of adaptation we look for is max strength, and that's the size principle. We're trying to recruit the high threshold motor units as fast as possible. And that happens at heavier loads greater than 80%, two to five reps. And that is our VBT. Um, we're gonna look at that under 0.50 meters per second. Then we get to rate coding, strength, speed, speed, strength, this is when we're starting to uh, transfer to sport and trying to take that strength in the early off season, turning it into power. And that's how fast we could send that signal down the nervous system, okay? Um, for different athletes, it happens at different percentages of a one rep max. For some it's 20, for some it's 40, for some it's 50, 60. That all depends on the athlete and VBT rules here because it will give you peak power output and you can work and keep increasing that percentage of the one rep max until you hit peak power. For some, it might be 30, for some, it might be 40, but when you do find it, you'll know what number you're looking for to train at peak power. 
And then sarcoplasmic reticulation. This is how quickly the system can release and reabsorb calcium and other substrates. Basically, this is our endurance, how long we can produce power for, and it's also how quickly we can recover from strenuous activity. That is doing series of sets and reps with very little break. Um, I call it explosive repeats. And it's done with very little body weight to 20% of a, rep, a one rep max. We're doing this in the end of the off season and throughout the course of the in season, which we'll talk about a bit. So here they are, the, the special strength zones. These are the zones that we look at throughout the year to create specific adaptations. Um, these can be at different times of the year for different sports, but they're the same for all sports. Everybody's got to train strength. Everybody's got to train power. Everybody's got to train speed, okay? Um, and some sort of endurance. So strength, max strength, 60 to 100% of one rep max. There's two types here. There's absolute strength, which we talked about, the size principle, that's 80 to 100%, and that happens at 0.5 meters per second or less. For our upper body ranges, if you look here underneath, it's basically about 0.10 less, and that is because there is a much more mechanical advantage on upper body exercises because the length of the arms make the movement shorter. We can generally grind out reps at lower, um, at lower velocities. So if you look across this meter, um, they're all basically um, lower, uh, about 1.0, 1.5 lower, and uh, that is based off of my findings. Um, and Ty Terrell also, uh, I think, believe he's a strength coach for the Houston Rockets. Um, he talked about this a bit as well. Um, so absolute strength and accelerative strength, that's our early off season. Then we're gonna transfer to sport peak power. That happens, like we said, for different athletes at different percentages, um, but lives somewhere around 0.80 to 1.2. And that's basically somewhere between 30 to 60% of your one rep max. Um, we use strength speed to train this power. We use speed strength to train this power. Some athletes need to train force more than velocity to create that power, and they'll use strength speed. Some athletes need to train velocity more than force, and that takes precedence. Um, and then starting strength is the ability to rapidly overcome inertia, basically from a dead stop. So understanding the metrics, BBT gives us crucial feedback associated with a movement. So the movements that it, it shows us are average and peak concentric velocities, okay, on both speed and ultimately power of the movement. LPTs, linear position transducers, as I said before, can also give us readings on force. Um, it also gives us velocity, we can use velocity cutoffs and losses. The velocity cutoffs tells us when to end a set, which is called a mean velocity threshold. And a percentage of loss between the first or best rep in the set is telling us about our velocity loss and how much we want to get tear down of that muscle. And we're gonna talk about all of these in the next upcoming slides. And it also gives us crucial feedback as far as auto regulation. How ready is the athlete on that specific day um, based off of uh, fatigue from stress or lack of sleep or whatever, uh, dehydration, whatever have you. So average mean concentric velocity. What this is, is this is the average speed during the entire concentric portion of the exercise. So if we're looking at a bench press, uh, we're looking for it from the beginning the movement starts all the way till it locks out. This includes the time spent purposely slowing down the speed of the loader movement as a natural reflex in order to avoid joint, tendon, and muscle injuries, otherwise known as deceleration. The lighter the weight we're using, the more the body has to decelerate the movement due to the speed at the end of the lift. As lifts get closer to 60 to 70% of a one rep max, obviously we're not lose, using, uh, we're not moving the load as quickly because of the, 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 the uh, intensity of the load. So there is not as much deceleration um, involved. Peak concentric velocity. So when we're using these really light lifts, um, we can use peak concentric velocity. 
Uh, it's usually calculating every five to 10 milliseconds, and it's simply the peak speed during the concentric portion of the exercise. It's basically giving us the quickest five to 10 milliseconds of the lift. This removes the time spent decelerating, um, which on loads less than 40 to 50% of one rep max can compromise upwards 50%, comprise upwards of 50% of the entire concentric contraction. So basically, when we're doing hang cleans and we're doing ballistic movements such as trap bar jumps or weighted jumps, these movements have a lot of deceleration so, um, to, to lock out. Um, and it gives us it gives us the quickest five to 10 milliseconds of that lift. Mean velocity threshold, stopping when the velocity drops. We're gonna talk about using cutoffs. This is another one of those geeky slides. So basically what this slide is telling me is when I'm looking at an athlete um, and I, wanna, I, I don't wanna bring him to failure, I personally, unless it's a bodybuilder, I do not bring athletes to failure. Um, this creates residual soreness for number one that creates to next day play. Um, or also, it's just, it's a recipe for disaster. Um, if they don't make it and they don't have a spotter, this can be really a, a really bad scene. Um, it's great for using for teams when the situation does not always allow for spotting. Um, so it's basically how many reps you have left in the tank. Okay, so it's based on a study by Jaidovsev et al. Um, on the lower body, um, we go with, when we, I set the cutoff for 0.30. Um, that lets me know that when an athlete's squatting and once he gets down to 0.30 on his reps and it's getting heavier for him, um, I will set a tone that lets me know that he's at 0.30. We cut the lift off there. If the athlete seems like he has a lot more left in the tank, then this means we have a stronger athlete and we can set that cutoff as low as 0.20. I never ever go below 0.20. Um, I hardly ever go below 0.25. But generally for safety purposes, we start with 0.30. This will let me know that the athlete has approximately one or three, if he's really strong, left in the tank. And for the upper body, once again, because of the mechanical advantage of the movement, um, we use a little bit lower. Um, I know for me on a bench press, um, I can go down to about 0.17 before I have one left in the tank. So um, I just happen to be good at bench pressing, um, but generally we set that for 0.25 to 0.35. This is really, really important for younger athletes um, because we do not, we do not need athletes who have been lifting one or two years who start using VBT. Um, we do not want to allow them to just uh, decide on their own if they've got one left. That, that could be a really bad scene. So I tell them, set it for 0.30. When you hear it, you're done. When you hear the tone, you're done. So uh, that's how we use velocity cutoffs. Um, <clears throat> velocity loss percentages. So we can look at the cutoff or we can set it for a percentage of their loss. And I'm gonna show you what I mean by that, I believe in the next slide. So um, this, uh, this, you can set the percentage of loss based off the first or the highest rep in the set. The device will ask you, do you wanna set your velocity loss based off of your highest rep in your set, which sometimes could be the second or third rep, or do you wanna base it off the first? I generally base it off of the first, even though I know a lot of times my second rep is higher. Um, this allows for a higher quality of work, as well as pinpointing breakdown of the cross-sectional area of the muscle according to the specific training adaptations desired. Here's examples of velocity losses associated with specific adaptations. For training hypertrophy, I'm gonna look for 40 to 50% of a loss from the first rep. If I'm looking for strength, I'm gonna look for 20 to 30, but honestly, I go 10 to 20. Um, this is something that I should probably correct. This, this, you can go 20 to 30, but because we're training strength and force output, I don't really want to go higher than 20. Um, and then for power or speed, we want that breakdown to be below 10 or 15%, because if it's any higher, we're really not training um, fast twitch power or speed. It's, it's basically becoming a big um, conditioning session. So, the following three examples are different ways I incorporate that velocity cutoffs 
and or velocity loss into my programs when training for hypertrophy, power, and or submax strength. Guys, this is another one of those geeky slides. So um, if you're going to watch this later, this is one that you could spend some time looking on. So there's three ways I do it. I either manipulate the reps, I manipulate the sets, or I manipulate the load, the amount of weight. So an example is a 250 pound, let's say, squat. <clears throat> if we're gonna do it for eight, and we want to train hypertrophy, we're going to look for Point, uh, 0.70 is our starting speed because we want to be able to get mass amounts of reps, so we use 40 to 70% of a one rep max for hypertrophy. The reps end when the target velocity of 0.35, okay, that's 50% of 0.70, um, that will bring us close to failure, um, happens. And note, for hypertrophy, this should be anywhere between 12 to 20 reps with one to two left in the tank, reps in reserve. So if I get to 0.35 and I've only got done six or eight reps um, at a 7.0, that means that my weight is not heavy enough um, and I need to up my reps closer to 20 um, and I need to lighten up the weight so I can get more time under tension and get those 12 to 20 reps. And that's that eight times question mark reps. Okay, the reason the question mark reps are there is because it depends where you're reaching that three five. For some guys it might be 12, for some guys it might be 20 if we're using a 0.70 starting time. If I manipulate the sets, I do this for when I'm training endurance and when I'm training power. Okay, you can see I use this for speed or power. Okay, once again, we're in a, we're in a, uh, strength speed zone because we're training power we're looking for under 10 percent loss okay so what happens is if that 250 pounds i'm going to do as many sets of three reps okay let's say i'm at an i'm, I'm at a 0 0.80 meters per section session uh per second which kind of relates to um 50 percent of your one rep max okay the sets end when the average set velocity drops below 0.72, okay? That's 10% of that 0.80. I will set my uh, VBT unit for a 10% velocity loss, or I can set it for a velocity threshold, 0.72. And when I hit 0.72, it will tell me that those, when I can no longer maintain three reps at 0.72, I'm done my sets. I ideally like to use six to 10 sets of three reps. So if you're hitting your, uh, your, velocity, your, your velocity loss is greater than 10%, greater than that 0.72, and you've only done four or five sets, um, I would lighten the load so we can actually get more before fatigue sets in. And this is the beauty of um, using velocity-based training because other than that, you're just estimating how how uh, how explosive you're being and then the last one is the manipulation of the load this is what i use when i'm strength training or power development if i take 250 and i'm doing it for eight sets of three and i'm using a 0 0.60 and we're using 0 0.60 because that roughly uh will be set set 70 percent and i'm working sub max strength um when that below drops below 48 that's 0.48 that's 20 percent of 0 0.60 Okay, once again, I can set that, the, the VBT unit at a 20% loss, or I can set it at 0.48 if I'm looking for um, that loss. Okay, it will give me a tone. If I'm dropping more than 20%, I'm going to lighten the load. And we can lighten this load from set to set. We can lighten the load on a day when we're not feeling as great, which is auto regulation, and it allows us to train to the readiness and it tells us when we can lower the weight. So we can lower that weight during the course of one uh, training session over the course of uh, eight sets, maybe by set uh, four or five, we're starting to get a little tired. Instead of muscling through that, um, we're going to actually lower the, lower the load and train in that 0.60 um, if we're trying to produce really great numbers in force. Auto-regulation. Auto regulation refers to a system that manages volume to regulate individual differences in an athlete's work capacity. 
I say individual because every athlete has different factors in their life that are creating stress. And when we train, we must consider these differences in readiness. And it's caused by fatigue, um, not just from training alone, but all the stressors in life, relationship problems, family problems, studying, finals, um, dehydration, a late night out. Um, VBT takes all of this into consideration. Um, and I'm gonna show an example of how these percentages of a one rep max um, can change as much as 15 to 20 percent day to day based on any of those stress parameters like loss of sleep or finals or family problems. So by utilizing this VBT, we could take these parameters into account by locking into a percentage of a bar or body speed, then percentage of a one rep max. Um, so we'll get a daily number after each rep and set, and we can see if the weight needs to be decreased due to the fatigue of that day. Or is it increased? Am I feeling new strength gains? Am I feeling good today? We can go up. So for example, if I'm bench pressing on day one, 200, and I'm looking for roughly a 6-2 number, okay, that equates to 285 pound one rep max. Okay, if I'm moving 200 pounds at 0.62, that, rough, that relates roughly to a 285 pound one rep max, okay? Um, I come in on day two, and for whatever reason, um, I'm, I'm, working up, I'm working up to my 200 pounds, and all of a sudden, I'm already at that 6162, and I'm only at 175 pounds, okay? Obviously, I'm not feeling as strong that day for whatever reason, overtraining, stress, what have you, okay? As you can see, my, rem, my one rep max that day is roughly 250 pounds, okay? That's 35 pounds less due to stress. OK, I'm not going to just load up that 200 and hit it because that's what I did on day one. That's just not smart training. Um, we will not get the adaptation we're looking for. If we're looking for peak force. That happens around 0.60. If I have to bring that 200 up on day two, I'm going to be down in the fives and I'm not going to create that true force production that I'm looking for. Um, and also, if I'm not feeling great, I could get hurt. And then on day three, I come in, great sleep, resolved all my issues. I come in, I'm working up, and maybe 200 pounds is at 0.65. I'm like, wow, I can go up a little bit. And now I'm at 210 for 6.3. Now I'm at a 300 pound one rep max. And you can see how that one rep max fluctuates from day to day based off of um, the weight that I'm pulling and my speed. So all three days utilize the desired velocity, approximately 0.60, but stress and fatigue affected the lows used and ultimately the athletes estimated one rep max for that day. So this is how we auto-regulate auto um, and get our estimated one rep max and we auto-regulate auto our training based off of our body. So um, here's, an, here's how we calculate power, okay? Once we're, once in the, in the mid off season, we start to transfer to sport, okay? So power, just getting a power number is not enough. There are different ways we can achieve power. And as we know or don't know, power is force times velocity. Um, peak power can be produced in either the strength speed or the speed strength zones, okay? Those zones, strength speed being roughly 7.5 to 1.0 and speed strength roughly 1.0 to 1.2. Um, once again, they differ for the athletes slightly. Different athletes produce their highest power numbers in either of these two zones, okay? Some athletes um, produce most power in strength speed. Some athletes produce it in speed strength. How do we know? We get a power peak power rating um, off of our velocity um, on VBT. It will give us, at the end of the lift, it will not only give us the speed, but it will give us our power output in watts based off of the load and velocity. And we can go up in weight. And as our power goes up, we keep putting on weight. Once we hit diminishing returns and our power goes down, we know that more weight is not necessarily better anymore to achieve ultimate power. Um, I like to lean a bit more on the velocity side with my athletes for most sports due to the rapid time component of in-game play. That peak power, that from my experience, that lives around somewhere between 
0.85 or 9 to 1.1. It's a really fine line. 1.0 is kind of that middle area between strength, speed, and speed strength. And um, that's a really, uh, that's, that's where most athletes create their peak power. So I want to give you an example of how two different athletes in the same sport can create power differently. 4,000 watts of power can be achieved through multiple combinations of force and velocity. Um, athlete one is an offensive lineman, okay? These guys generally work on the force side of power, okay? Um, because they, are, they constantly have a, a force applied against them um, for periods of time on every play, um, fighting off another line, okay? Um, peak power produced um, for a squat was 175 pounds at 75 meters per second, okay? That is in the strength speed side, okay? Um, and he may be uh, producing 800 watts of, uh, of power from his force and 500 watts of power from the speed of the movement, okay? And that's his 4,000 watts. Uh, whereas we have a quarterback who doesn't really um, use that. He really needs to be on the velocity side more. He has to run. He has to jump. He has to throw really quickly. Um, and he doesn't have a resistance on him um, for the entirety of the play. So this athlete, he produces his peak power maybe with 120 pounds at 1.0. Okay, He's now getting a, his 800 watts of power from the velocity side. From the speed side, because he's at a faster speed, he's at a less weight for himself, and that's maybe 500 watts of force, okay? He's in the speed strength zone. So wherever peak power um, happens, peak wattage, um, that is the speed you look for. Um, it much depends on the type of athlete we have in front of us, and that's why VVT is so valuable, because it will not only tell us the speed we're moving, but it will tell us if that is the appropriate speed to create peak power by also getting a reading on the wattage we're producing um, based off of the load and the speed of the lift. Um, prerequisites. Heavier is not always better. Uh, Tudor Bompa said all strength relates back to absolute strength, but getting stronger is only part of the equation. Um, expressing force quickly, which is our rate coding, is gold in sports performance. Um, even more than myofibril strength at 80 to 95, even more than our size principle. Um, we, need, we need absolute strength because it's what all other types of strength, power, speed sit on, but at some point, we need to be able to get fast. If you want to be fast, at some point, we need to transfer training to be fast as well. So speed of the lift matters for transfer of sport. Later in the off season, um, we need to start using VVT to make sure we're moving the weight quickly. And don't forget, you're still the coach. So this is, I can't emphasize this enough. VVT dictates the load. It does not dictate form or technique. So make sure your guys, which brings us to our qualifications, have good form, okay? What I look for in my guys, I look for at least one to two years of prior lifting experience. It is really, um, it's really, really not a great idea to just strap VBT on a novice athlete. Um, their form is not good. They're gonna do whatever they can to get that speed. And, you know, creating a competitive environment with a kid who doesn't have good form um, is a recipe for disaster. Um, they're going to arch that back. They're going to round that back. They're going to pull with their arms. They're going to get a forward head. They're going to do whatever they can to get that weight up. So I, I look for a guy to have at least one to two years of prior lifting experience. No one in my gym um, trains on VBT unless they're 17 years or older. I, I, and I make it a uh, privilege for my 11th and 12th graders to get VBT. They have to qualify. They have to have been with us for at least a year to a year and a half and they need to have good form. On the right is a uh, photo of a graph by, I believe it was Vern Gambetta, who showed what he looks for from the bottom up, and that work capacity, mobility and conditioning. Um, if you do not have good mobility and you don't have good conditioning, um, it's not a great idea to um, use VBT yet, because once again, it plays hand in hand with not having great form. Um, and if you're, if you're tired, um, you know, that is, uh, 
that's the enemy, you know, of good form. So if, you're, if your work capacity is, is low and you don't have good mo mobility, um, you're not going to get into these um, efficient positions. Um, you're not ready for VBT. But once proper form is established, VBT comes into play. Um, we work on base strength and we work on transfer to specific strength and power up that chain all the way into in season when we're working on speed. Don't overdo it. Only after form is cleaned up and you know, guys, please, no more than three exercises per workout. Um, you don't want to slap VBT on everything you have. Um, it becomes, um, I use it for the prime movers. I basically use it on my deadlift. I use it on my squat. I'll use it on pull-ups. I'll use it on incline rows. Um, I'll use it on bench press. Uh, I don't use it on exercises that are designed for mobility and stability. It's a little dumb to be trying to see how fast you're moving something when you're working on mobility or you're working on something with stability like an overhead squat or a Turkish getup where we're not really interested in how fast you're doing it, but how well you're creating stability in those joints and how efficiently you're creating movement through the chain to, to, to efficiently do these exercises. So the last few slides, we're gonna talk about implementing VBT into the annual plan. Um, I'm gonna use a baseball athlete because this is, um, this is the clientele that I train 80, 85, I would say 85 to 90% of my, my uh, athletes are baseball players. Um, <clears throat> but the periodization changes, but what we train in these periods does not. The amount of time we spend in them does, uh, and when they happen during the year, um, that changes from sport to sport. My months here are what happens for me with my high school and college uh, and pro baseball players. Um, these, these months will be different for a soccer player. These months will be different for a lacrosse player. These months will be different for a football player, at what at, or what have you. Um, so in the preparatory period, we have anatomical adaptation. This is getting the tissues ready, okay, to do heavier lifting, that submax, hypertrophy two, and absolute strength. We use that um, anatomical adaptation to develop tensile strength and tissue quality um, and to get ready to lift heavier. So the use of VBT is only relevant for determining the starting load because we use slow eccentric movements, and we use isometric loading at the bottom. We're not interested in how quickly you're moving the weight because we already know we're trying to go really close to failure, and the weight is going to get really slow. We need a lot of reps, and as a result, we need the VBT number to be higher, and that's why I look for around 7.0 to 8.0 as a starting uh, weight. Once I get 7.0 to 8.0, that tells me what weight to look for my 10 to 20 reps. Um, and that's why we use it. Hypertrophy, I don't use much, but it's very similar to anatomical adaptation. We're basically looking for time under tension, high reps, same thing, 40 to 50% um, tear down of muscle, um, creates a lot of soreness due to the eccentric component and the holds. And it's used mostly in bodybuilding, which is not a good look for my guys or most athletes that are trying to move fast. Um, Submax strength, this is all what we train in the early and mid off season, okay? Um, Submax strength, once we strengthen the, the tissue and, a, and the uh, <clears throat> tendons, we go to Submax strength hypertrophy two. This is using heavier loads, 60 to 80. We're working on force production. We're working on at the higher end of that with hypertrophy two, 75 to 85%. We're looking for um, hypertrophy of the prime movers, the fast twitch fiber, okay? Different than regular hypertrophy. And we're using 50 to 75. That's accelerative strength. And then once we use accelerative strength, we're into absolute strength. This is where we're going to work on the size principle, okay? We're looking for greater than 80% of a one rep max. We're generally doing three to five reps. Um, and I'm looking that that greater than 80 is loads, um, 
lower than slower than 0.50 meters per second, and we're only looking for velo losses of 10 to 20 percent because we're looking for all good reps with not a lot of muscle teardown. We've got that up in the hypertrophy section with our bigger uh, velocity losses. We're trying to create absolute strength. We're looking for the fast twitch motor units to uh, recruit all at the same time and quickly. So we're not looking for a lot of fatigue. We're looking for heavy weight lifted um, with minimal teardown. Transition uh, later in the off season, we transition to sport. This is January and February, March for my guys. Um, this is where we use combinations of strength. So we're at that absolute strength and we'll do, um, we'll do a set of three at, at 0.50 or less. And then we'll hit strength, speed or speed strength, wherever that athlete, remember we said creates peak power. We'll have him bang out a set of three to five. Um, sometimes this is body weight if he's in speed strength or trap bar jumps or something of, of that matter. Um, immediately after. So we're going to um, activate with the heavier weight, then we're going to potentiate with those lighter weights. And then in season, we use undulating, more nonlinear programming, where we train strength, power, and power endurance um, all at one time in one session uh, or throughout the course of one week. We don't break it up like we do here throughout the course of the season because we're trying to work on only the things in season that the athlete um, is, is, is losing. They're called training residuals, okay? And we'll talk about that. So I'm just gonna talk about really quickly each one of these, and then I'm gonna open it up to questions. So in the early preparatory period, we talked about anatomical adaptation. This is 0.70 to 0.80 for 12 to 20 reps. I like to use a 4-0-0 tempo to, to um, grab that eccentric component. Um, and sometimes I'll use a 3-2-0 and hold it in the bottom position for two. The main goal is to improve tensile strength and regroove good movement patterns, which is great for people coming back from injuries because we're using lighter loads, okay? But we are going close to failure. So using that isometric hold in the low position increases the time under tension, solidifies movement patterns, um, and both tissue prep and hypertrophy phases help increase applications. And once again, like I said before, use of VBT is only relevant in this phase for determining the starting load. We are not looking for um, uh, what, our, what our velocity is on every load. Our starting load, what we're looking for is this 30 to 40, 40 to 50% of a velocity loss um, where we'll set the VBT unit to give us a signal when we're at that loss and we wanna make sure we're at that loss within this rep scheme. If not, we need to either raise or lower the load. In the mid-preparatory pre-season, sub-max strength, this is where I use hypertrophy. This is where I use six to nine reps at 5.0 to 7.5, 60, 80% for sub-max strength, um, 70 to 80 for hypertrophy too, a little heavier. And we're looking for velocity losses of 10 to 20 for sub-max strength because we want pure strength with not a lot of teardown, and 20 to 40 um, on hypertrophy two um, of the first or best rep for hypertrophy two to get a little bit more teardown of the prime movers. The main goal is the ability to coordinate all muscles in the kinetic chain in a single action. It's coordination. We're using a heavy enough weight to uh, activate all the muscles, but we're using a light enough weight that we can still co uh, um, control our coordination, okay? And that's intermuscular coordination. And then we've, prep, we've primed the, tens, the, the tendons, we've gone, uh, we've, we've started some hypertrophy, we've gotten into uh, submax strength loading, and now we're gonna go heavy, okay? For about four weeks, I go heavy six weeks. That's two to five reps at under 5.0. This is greater than an 80% of a one rep max. With VLO losses, once again, of 10 to 20 of the first or best rep. And this is intramuscular coordination. This is the capacity to recruit as many motor units as possible in the shortest amount of time. This is basically strength, okay? So that's why we're doing low reps with high weight. The high weight kicks, the, kicks more muscles in at the same time than lighter weight. And we're doing lighter reps, uh, lower reps because we're using a heavier load and we wanna maintain the integrity of the lift. In the later off season, we're gonna take that strength we've just built up and we're gonna transition it to sports specific power. 
strength, power, post-activation, potentiation, which I explained before, where we it's a combination of absolute strength for two to five reps at under 0.50, and then either strength speed, and there's your velocities, or speed strength at higher velocities, depending on the athlete and where they produce their peak power. And we're looking for velocities of under 10% uh, for power and 10 to 20 for our strength. So when we're doing that absolute strength for two to five reps, we're looking for 10 to 20% loss, no more. And then when we're doing our second act, our, our potentiation with our strength speed or our speed strength exercise, our more ballistic movements, we're looking for power and we're looking for under 10% velocity loss to make sure we're maintaining power. It's once again, uh, it's training intramuscular coordination, it's training alactic power, it's using the creatine phosphate system, um, and uh, we're working on power endurance. It's important to not only train explosively, but we have to be able to do it over and over again. So training for power endurance requires on calling all three energy systems and uh, working together to get the job done, and that's when we're using um, our strength speed and our speed strength zones when we're doing series of sets. Here's an example of what post-activation potentiation is. He's going to use 80 to 90% of his one rep max. He's going to activate the glutes and the hamstrings with a hip lift, okay, a hip thrust. He'll take about a minute break, and then he'll get in the bar, and he'll use 20 to 40% of his one rep max. This is 135, um, and I'm just using it as an example. Uh, and he's using it and he's jumping with it and he's activating the same glutes and hamstrings that we, uh, that we activated. He's now potentiating it, the muscle, um, by using a more ballistic movement. That's post-activation potentiation and it's usually done uh, for me eight weeks before the season begins. Uh, in season, management of training residuals, playing sports makes athletes better, technical side, but it does not make them stronger. We have to figure out um, what we lose. And in the in-season for pitchers, I train in, in one session. I'll train 40% of their session will train absolute strength, 40% will train power, and 20% will train power endurance. These are the three traits that athlete, that baseball players tend to lose once playing starts, okay? Um, you can see it's different for position players. Once again, this is the difference maybe between a lineman, offensive lineman, and a quarterback. So um, there are, Tudor Bampa has a great, great uh, article on um, training residuals and what different athletes lose um, in their season. Uh, and these are, this is my, this is my book, Velocity-Based Training, How to Apply Science, Tech, and Data to Maximize Performance. And you can use the promo code uh, for BB, BBT20 and get 20% off the Velocity-Based Training. You can go to the us.humankinetics.com website, and this uh, discount expires on June 30th. Uh, thanks. This is me. This is my Twitter page. Um, you can also email me at nunzio at rocklandpeakperformance.com. Uh, this is my facility, Rockland Peak Performance. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, being here, tuning in. Like I said, it's a lot of information, but um, please uh, go back and watch the recording where you can actually watch at your own time and kind of sink into some of these slides. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Alexa. Okay, thanks. So, Nizia, while we um, while you're speaking, thank you for a great presentation. We had um, a few questions come in, and I, I will open it now for if other people want to add their questions to the questions tab, uh, go ahead and do that now. So, one of them we received is, what adjustments would you make for master's athletes? Okay, for master's, for master's athletes, these guys generally are strong enough, unless they're power lifters. Um, I, my guys that are, 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 are reaching an elite level of athlete, they're generally going to spend the majority of their time um, working on power and um, speed strength and strength speed, um, coordination, um, all, the, all the ways they can apply that 
that, e that elite strength that they already have. Master athletes are master athletes for a reason. Most of them are strong enough. If you want to increase, uh, if you want to increase their performance, I would increase their speed. Um, I would feed them max strength maybe once a week, once every 10 days. I would look for that uh, below, um, you know, 0.50 meters per second, um, just to actually make sure we're maintaining that strength. That's that absolute strength. And I would work on accelerative strength to increase force production. And I would work on anything above, I would work on the heaviest I would go most of the time would be above anything above 60% of a one rep max. Okay. Uh, we have another person today that they currently use rep one unit uh, for bar seats, but it doesn't configure power. And the question is, it seems like it measures everything else, but their question is the easiest way to figure power then. The easiest way to figure power is through a uh, a a formula. Um, you know, uh, that's a tough question that I really can't answer. Um, I know it's force times velocity or force times uh, acceleration, um, but I don't I don't personally have that that um, that formula. You can look it up online, but I would suggest getting a unit um, that gives you power. I know the push units give you power. Um, that's huge for me because in the late off season, I, all I'm looking at is power percentage. Where, do, where are they creating peak power? If I've got a guy with a CMJ jump, weighted vest CMJ jump, and he's creating, his, he's creating power at 0.85, and we know we're in a strength speed zone, and he's creating 3,000 watts of power, and then I load him up a little heavier, and he's creating 3,200 watts of power, and then I load him up a little heavier, and he creates 2,900 watts of power. I can hone in on what what load he needs to create peak power and have him work at that load. So I would highly suggest um, getting a unit that, you know, most of them, most of them calculate power. You should get one that calculates power. That would be my best suggestion to you. Okay. All right. Another question we received is how do you work strength, power, and power endurance into the same session? Um, and then what order would you uh, use for each of these? Okay, I would work strength power because it is a heavier load. I would work strength power into the session first. Um, and then basically my, uh, my, my power endurance is done for series. So I would work strength power. Say I'm going to look for a guy and he's going to use uh, he's going to perform uh, eight sets of three at 0 0.80 meters per second. Okay, that's going to put him in the strength speed zone. That's going to put him in the power zone. Um, and then when I want to work on power endurance, um, that is more specific to the sport. I'm going to give him. Um, I'm going to give him maybe six sets of three um, with whatever the break needed for field athletes i make that a 10 second break because they they sprint they stop they sprint they stop so he would do six sets of three say weighted jumps or body weight jumps take a 10 second break okay um in between each set of three so we'll do a set of three 10 second break set of three 10 second break for six sets i would take a two minute break and then i would do another series of six sets of three with 10 second breaks in between the reps so that way I'm working within the sport. For me, I use 30 seconds because baseball is, is ballistic for one second and then it takes a 30 second break in between pitches. So for my pitchers, they're going to do eight sets of three, um, maybe split squat jumps or hydens, and they're going to take 30 seconds in between um, each, each set of three or five. And then they're going to do that for eight sets and they're gonna take two minute break. And I may give them three series of that to simulate a couple innings. And that's how I would do it. I use, I use the power endurance as a finisher. Okay, um, I think we have enough time. We'll do two more questions. Um, one of them is, could you elaborate a bit more as to why accelerometers cannot be used to calculate force? Um, an accelerometer can be used to calculate force. Um, the, accelera the accelerometers on the market um, they they have a tendency of wanting you to spend thousands of dollars on a uh, portal where they will calculate it for you. Um, I believe that an accelerometer can calculate force, but 
it's it's at a high cost for a portal. Um, the reason that tender units calculated very easily is because it's a it's it's an actual measurement, um, whereas an accelerometer is kind of creating a um, a formula uh, based off of the movement in space and time, um, and it doesn't really give you an adequate description. But I believe that accelerometers, I said they can't calculate force. They, I believe they can calculate force. There's a lot of work involved, and the portal will do it for you. It just comes at a high cost. Okay. And um, there was a, a, a simpler question here um, that I think would be helpful for everybody. Is how do you calculate one rep max using BBT? Okay. What we do is we um, we take the athlete in. Uh, we we set up a, like say we're doing a trap bar deadlift one rep max. I'm going to I'm going to put light load on, and when um, I'm going to I'm going to take like we look for we take two times his body weight. So if we have a 200 pound male. We're looking for a 400 pound one rep max. We're only going to use that to get our starting loads. Um, everybody, uh, you're supposed to be able to deadlift two times your body weight, but we know that a lot of guys cannot. So what I do is I start at 40% of a, of a two times body weight. So I would take 400 pounds and I would take 40% of that and I would have him lift it for three. I would take a 90 second break. I would put 50% on. I would have him lift it for three. I would put 60% on after 90 seconds, have him lift it for three. And wherever I start to see him get down to about 3-0 or 4-0, um, I'm going to cut it at like 4-0 because I'm not looking for um, I'm not looking for an actual one rep max because with a lot of guys that can create a problem. So once I get to 4-0, I know that that's going to correlate to 80, 90% of my one rep max. Um, for, a, for a younger athlete, I'm going to take it to 75% only, and I'm going to look for, say, 0.60, okay? And that will tell me that he's at, um, 0.60 will tell me he's at 60% of his one rep max at that weight. And then I will calculate the weight he just lifted, and if he's at 60%, that will tell me what his one rep max is. If he moves uh, 200 pounds at 0.8, um, maybe that tells me that he's at 50% of his one rep max. Um, that means his one rep max is 400. If he's moving 200 pounds at 0 0.40, that's 90% of his one rep max. That means that he, maybe his one rep max is only 250. But you'll look at the percentage of what 0 0.40 correlates to and the weight he's lifting. And that's going to tell you uh, if he's lifting at 40, which is 95%, and he's lifting 200 pounds, he's lifting 95% roughly of his estimated one rep max. Okay. Okay. And then just one last question, and you addressed this in your presentation itself, but um, somebody's asked about a recommendation for using VBT for training 14-year-old athletes, and I think you addressed this was probably not the best choice, but can you just uh, reiterate that? Um, I would never use VBT on a 14-year-old athlete. Um, it, there's, there's no point in it. Um, we know what they need to train. We're not looking for a specific training adaptation in a 14-year-old. We're looking for strength gains. We're looking for strength gains all the way up until they're 16 years old, 17 years old. Um, there's one, you know, just get them strong. 14-year-old needs to A, have fun, and B, um, they just need to learn how to move properly, and they're going to show great gains without VBT. Um, it's when we get into one, two, three years of lifting weight, um, and strength is just not enough anymore. Um, that's when we that's when we implement VBT. Okay, thank okay. you for reiterating. All right, so I just wanted to say thank you again to everyone for joining today's presentation. And Noonview, I want to thank you for just a great presentation for everybody. You can purchase Thanks. the book training on our website at us.humankinetics.com. A couple of people had asked throughout. Um, what is that promo code again? It's VBT20, and that can be used at us.humankinetics.com. And you will be receiving a recording of today's presentation via email, and it should arrive within a day or two um, in your inbox. So thank you again, and I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thanks, Alexis. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.